Hi, I'm Bob Flisser, author of Excel video courses for Excel 2010, 2013, and 2016. And in the 2016 version, Excel has a handful of new functions to help you forecast numbers more accurately than before. These are typically sales data, sales numbers, but they don't have to be. Now, the older forecast function still exists for backwards compatibility with worksheets created in older versions, but if you're creating a new worksheet, you want to use one of these. The first one I'll show you is called forecast.linear. That's the actual name of the function. Some functions have dots in there, and that's a straight line estimate, and that's most similar to the older forecast function. There's also forecast.ets, and that estimates the trend using seasonality. So let's say you have seasonal data in your numbers. You want to use the forecast.ets. Now, what is that season? What is the length of that season? Well, the forecast.ets.seasonality will tell you. So maybe you have a six-month season or a 12-month season that will show you. That doesn't mean that your on-season, the season where you're selling the most, for example, is going to be that number. That just means what is the entire cycle, like how many months, for example, are in that entire cycle. Now, how confident are you or how confident is Excel in the results? For that, you want to use forecast.ets.confint. And if you're familiar with statistics, that is what's called the confidence interval. And speak of statistics, there is also a forecast.ets.stat that will show you about eight different statistics if you want them. Now, these functions work the same in both the Windows and Mac versions of Excel 2016. And once you have the results, you can create a forecast chart that shows you what the forecasted numbers are and the expected or possible margins of error. Now, the Windows version does a much better job of that. It does it kind of more automatically, but I'll show you both. I'll show you the Mac version as well. Now, you see the workbook I have open here is called forecastfunctions.xlsx, and if you want to follow along with me, you could download this worksheet at the address that you have on your screen. It's a zip file. Simply unpack the zip, and there's a single Excel file in there. Now, you notice that there are two tabs in this worksheet, straight line and seasonality. Straight line is more simple, it's more straightforward. Let's start with that. So here we have a column of dates and we have a column of units sold. And I'll just scroll down here. There is no seasonality in here. These numbers are all kind of in the same range. And the last number that we have data for, you can see here, is B33. That's May 2017. For June, we have no data yet. So we're going to use a straight line forecast for June through December 2017. And you notice here, these two columns are critical, that the dates and units sold, we need these ranges of data in all of these forecasting functions. You always have to have dates and you always have to have some kind of number. It could be units sold, dollars sold, expenses, what have you. So before we do a straight line forecast, let me show you the syntax of the function. So that function, as I mentioned earlier, is forecast.linear. And the syntax is as follows. You say equals forecast.linear, and in the parenthesis we have three arguments. The first argument is the date that we are forecasting to. The second argument is what is the range of the current sales. And I'm using sales here as an example. If you're going to be forecasting other numbers, you can just you know, translate that. The third argument is what is the current dates of those numbers that you're forecasting. So on this worksheet, we have the range of dates going from A5 down to A33, and we have the sales from B5 down to B33. Now, rather than using those ranges in the formula, I've made it a little easier and I've created some range names for you. And if you click up here in the name box, you can see we have four range names. We've got two range names for this worksheet and two range names for the seasonality worksheet that we'll look at in a little bit. So if you click here, this dates sheet one, you can see here there's that range going down through the last date that has data in it. And if you click that name box and choose units sheet one, you can see similarly, here's the range of all of the units sold. 
So those ranges are not for the dates that haven't occurred yet and the numbers that haven't occurred yet. That's for the data that we already have. Okay, so let's go do it. Click here in cell B34, and we're going to say equals forecast. And notice as you start typing in FOR equals FORE, Excel gives you uh, some suggestions of what to choose. So let's choose this one here at the bottom, forecast linear. You can double click it or you can cursor down with your arrow cursor on the keyboard. And we're going to say the first thing is the date. So we're forecasting here is the first date in A34, comma. Now we want the units. And we saw what those were a moment ago in the name box. And let's say you're doing this, you don't remember what they are. What you can do is press the F3 key, the F3 function key on your keyboard. If you're using a Mac, you'll probably press the press function and F3. That brings up the paste name dialog box. So we want the units for sheet one. So there is units sheet one, double click, comma, and I'll hit the F3 key again. And now we want dates for sheet one. That's this, we can double click and that gets popped in there. And that's it. Close the parenthesis, press enter. We can see it's 773. Now all we have to do is autofill. Click on that 773. And if you're familiar with the autofill, I'm sure you are at this point in your life, normally the mouse pointer is this big old fat plus sign. If you put the mouse pointer on this little dot in the lower right corner of that 773, your mouse pointer turns to that crosshair. And now you can click and drag down to the bottom. Or let me just undo, I'll press Control Z. When you get that crosshair, you can double click. And double clicking will go down to the bottom. And this works, again, the same exact way on the Mac as in Windows. And now we can see here is the range of, here is the forecasted range that we have, and the numbers are all pretty much similar to what we had before. Okay, so let's take a look at seasonality. What happens if we have seasonal data? And that gets a little bit more complex. So let's go over here to the seasonality worksheet. So in this worksheet, we have three full years of data. Now let's actually scroll up here. You can see we're starting in January 2015, and also we have these numbers in the hundreds until we get to the fourth quarter. Then all of a sudden in the fourth quarter, uh, we have sales in the thousands. So this is kind of a typical thing, like maybe consumer electronics, for example, where you have higher sales at the end of the year. And this pattern repeats for the following year, and then it repeats for the third year. The seasonality forecasting in Excel works best if you have three full years of data. For now, ignore these three columns, C, D, and E. We'll get to those in a little bit. And what we want to forecast here are these numbers here in gray, what's going to happen in 2018. And you can see that these are blank. So let's take a look at the syntax first. We say equals forecast.ets. By the way, that ETS stands for exponential triple smooth. And that simply means that Excel is going to estimate the numbers based on trends and the seasonality, and it's going to give the most weight to recent data declining exponentially. So the first three arguments, the required arguments, are just like what we saw in the linear, in the straight line forecast. What's the date that we're forecasting to, the range of the current sales, the range of the current dates. Then we have three optional arguments. The first is how many seasonal data points do we have? Now, if you make that a zero, Excel is going to assume that there is no seasonality. If you leave that empty, Excel is going to guess how many seasonal date points do we have. Now, in the example that I just showed you, the seasonality, it's not three, it's not those three higher numbers. The seasonality is 12 because we have a 12 month cycle of, you know, of the first nine low numbers and then three high numbers. The second optional argument is data completion. And data completion means that if you don't have a sales value for a particular period, maybe it didn't sell anything in August, for example, then what happens? Well, there are two possible numbers, zero or one. Now, one is the default, and that means that Excel is going to fill in the blank. It's going to fill in that missing number by averaging the previous and next value. So if you, have, if you don't have any numbers for August, Excel is going to average uh, July and September. And if you specify a zero, then it means missing values will be treated as actual zeros. And the last argument, the third optional argument is aggregation. 
And what the aggregation means is what if you have multiple values for the same period? Maybe you have two numbers for August, two numbers for September. What should Excel do? So the options are, number one, to average the two together. That's the defaults. If you don't specify anything, that's what it's going to do. And then you have these other six functions that Excel will use to kind of combine those. Okay, so let's go back to the worksheet. So like in the previous worksheet, I created some range names to make this easier for you. And if we click on the name box, you can see we have the dates for sheet two. So that's all the dates for which we already have data. And click on that name box and units for sheet two. Here's all the units down column B for which we have data. So that extends only to row 40, nothing for row 41. That's where we're going to start doing our calculations. So let's go to cell B41 and let's enter the formula already. So we were going to say equals forecast and we're going to use that forecast.ets. And this time, instead of double clicking, I'll just hit the tab key. So the date that we're forecasting to is a 41 comma. Then we have the units for sheet two. And like before, I'll press the F3 key. So units for sheet two is there. Just double click comma. Now we need the dates for sheet two. So again, I'll hit the F3 key and there are the dates for sheet two. Double click that. And I'm going to leave those three optional arguments out because we're not using any of them. We don't have double data. We don't have missing data, anything like that. So I will simply close the parenthesis, press enter, and we can see that Excel is estimating about 926. And like before, we can click on that, get the mouse pointer over the autofill dot. And so we have the crosshair, double click, and here we have our forecast down to June. Now, one of the optional arguments in that forecast.ets that I did not use was the seasonality itself. I did not specify here's how long the seasonal cycle is. Excel, I just let Excel guess it. Well, what if we want to know what Excel is guessing? How do we know what number Excel is using in that formula? That's what that seasonality function is. So let's go down over here to cell B48, and I'll give you the syntax for that. So for that, our syntax is, we say equals forecast.ets.seasonality. And just like before, we have the range of sales, we have the range of current dates. And then also, like before, we have the optional arguments of data completion and aggregation. So there are no new types of arguments for this, which is kind of nice. So back here in Excel, we'll make sure that we're in B48, and we're going to say equals, I'll start typing, and I'll just kind of cursor over forecast.ets.seasonality and F3, and we want to put in the units for sheet two, comma, hit the F3 key again, the dates for sheet two, and that's really it. Close the parenthesis, enter, and you can see that Excel says, oh yeah, that is a 12-month seasonal cycle. Okay, so now that we have these numbers, how confident are we, or how confident is Excel, that these numbers are correct? That's what we're going to use the confint function for. Let me show you the syntax of that. The syntax is forecast.ets.confint, and most of these arguments we've already discussed, so I don't have to tell you again. We have the date to forecast to, the sales range, the date range. The confidence level here is the one argument we haven't talked about. And you can see we have optional arguments like we've seen before, number of data points, data completion, aggregation. That confidence level by default is 0.95 or 95%. So if you don't specify a number for the confidence level, Excel is just going to use that 0.95. And if you know statistics, that 95% might be a little familiar to you. That's roughly four standard deviations or roughly four sigma. So let's go use this. So we're going to start for the first estimated number. So let's click here in C41. You can see there's the column for confidence. So we say equals four, and I'll just cursor over this conf int. So the target date is that first date in the future, or at least at the time of this recording, it's in the future, January 2018 comma, and then kind of like before, the units. So I'll hit F3, and here's the units for sheet two, comma, hit the F3 key again, and the dates for sheet two, there we go. And I'm going to leave the default 
95% uh, confidence, close the parenthesis, press enter. And we can see that Excel is telling us, well, we expect that the January 2018 units will be 926 plus or minus 226. And let's take that and autofill it down to the bottom. And if you want, we could get rid of the decimals on the home tab of the ribbon. We can click this button over here to decrease decimal. And I'll just click it a bunch of times to get rid of all those annoying decimals. So what do we do with these confidence numbers once we have them? Well, we can calculate here in columns D and E the upper bound, the higher estimate, and what the lower bound is, the lower estimate of those numbers. And this is simply addition and subtraction. So let's go over here to D41, and we're going to say equals the estimated units sold plus the confidence. And this time, instead of pressing Enter, I'll press Control-Enter so I stay in that same cell and autofill it down to the bottom. And for the lower bound, it's going to be similar. We say equals the estimated units sold minus the confidence. And again, press Control-Enter. If you're on the Mac, you can press Command-Enter. And now when we've got that lower bound, we'll double click down to the bottom. So January 2018, this is what Excel is estimating, but it could be as high as these and could be as low as these. Now we'll go and chart these, but first I want to show you the statistics function. So scroll down if you need to, and let's go over here into cell B51. And let me show you the syntax of the statistics function. So the syntax of this function is equals forecast.ets.stat. And most of these arguments we've seen already, the current sales range, the current date range. Then there's the statistic type. We haven't seen that yet. And then we have three optional arguments that we also saw earlier. So that statistic type, you have eight choices. And these are all statistics functions, the alpha, beta, gamma, maze metric, SMAPE metric, MAE, RMSE, and step size. Uh, the alpha parameter is the default. So if you don't specify a statistic type, that's what Excel is going to give you. So let's take a look. So make sure you're here in cell B51, and we're going to say equals 4, and I'll just cursor over to the stat function and press tab, and I'll hit the F3 key, and we're going to have the units for sheet 2, comma, hit the F3 key again, the dates for sheet 2, comma, and I want to get a beta distribution, so I'll put in two. So you see they, they have them here, so you don't have to memorize what they are. So you could type in that two like I did, or you could just double click on that number two, and that's it. I'm going to close a parenthesis, press enter, and you can see that beta distribution is really, really low. Okay, so what if we want to get a chart of these numbers? Click somewhere here in the data area, and on Windows, press Control A, or if you're on the Mac, you can press Command A, and this is going to select this entire range of numbers here. All right, so we don't, we aren't selecting the blank row below it or the blank comma. I'm sorry, the blank column <laughs> to the right of it. So let's go over here to the data tab. So again, this is something that exists only in Windows. Then I'll show you how to do it on the Mac. So in the Windows version, we go to the data tab. And over here on the right side, towards the right of the ribbon bar, we have this forecast sheet. Click that. Let me drag this in here, and you can see. And this is great. This shows us what the units sold are, definitely, until the last uh, actual input data. And then we have this solid, thick orange line is the forecast numbers, and then we have the upper bound and the lower bound. And check this out. We can change the forecast date, and you see this options. Let's click that, twirl that open. Let me move this up here so you can see it. And we can change all of these. We can change dynamically when it's going to end, when it's going to start. We can change the confidence interval, seasonality. Do you want to detect it or not? Um, do you want to include the statistics like we just did? And you can also adjust the timeline range and the values range. And like we're uh, talking about before, some of those optional arguments, uh, how do you want to fill missing data points? Or if you have multiple data points, how do you want to deal with these? So these are the options that we saw in the function, and it does it graphically. So right now, this is obviously a line chart, but maybe you want to see this as a column chart. Here in the upper right corner, you can click that button 
and do a column chart. For this kind of data, I think a line chart is a lot better. So let's go and click Create. And this gives us a chart. And it's like a regular old chart that you would have anywhere else in Excel. We have the Chart Tools Design tab and Format tab on the ribbon. And also you notice that the data, it turns the data into a table so we can go and filter this and sort it as we like. And there is your chart. Okay, so this is terrific. What if you're using the 2016 version of Excel on a Mac and you don't have this? Let me delete it. So I'm gonna undo. I'll just hit the Control Z a few times. So let's go back here. I'll press Control A to select all. And I'm gonna go to the Insert tab and I'm going to insert a regular old 2D line and let me stretch it out here. So you see, it's not quite as nice, not quite as fancy. Let me scroll down and move it to make this a little bigger. So it's not quite as nice or as fancy. You notice that we have these three uh, lines there and this confidence, we don't really need that. So what we can do is simply select that and press delete. So it's not as quite as good, but you have kind of the general gist. So if you really need to forecast, you're better off using the Windows version. So that is how you do forecasting in the 2016 version of Excel. Again, my name is Bob Flisser, and I hope you found this helpful.